Hi, uh, thank you for joining us for our second session of Behind the Cover. Today we are very excited to have the wonderful artist David Curtis joining us. David Curtis is an illustrator and designer who has worked in a wide bright range of markets, such as publishing, editorial, film, advertising, and animation, with clients and collaborators including Paramount Pictures, NASA, Penguin Random House, HarperCollins, Scholastic, and Macmillan, to name a few. Now living in Brooklyn, New York, he is a design manager for HarperCollins Children's Books, as well as a freelance illustrator. And with that said, I'm going to let David take over with his presentation. Hi. Uh, like she said, I'm David Curtis. Uh, I work for HarperCollins Children's Books and am a freelance illustrator. Um, so I put together a, a presentation of just some, some work I've done in the past and also some uh, some slides about the process of how these things come uh, come to be. So, uh, oh, make sure I can move this. So, to start off, um, I'm an illustrator. I went to school at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia for illustration, um, and after school, worked my way into design and became uh, a designer, and uh, within the publishing world. And because of that, uh, working in publishing. For my day job and illustrating on the side, a lot of my illustrations became uh, publishing based, which is uh, really nice and fun. So here's some of the most recent work I've done. Uh, uh, Victoria Schwab is an amazing uh, YA sci-fi uh, along the lines of like a horror genre author. And this is her newest book, Gallant, about this house with this kind of alternate ghost uh, reality. Um, so this is an illustration about how how that is, uh, Who We Were in the Dark, which is a mystery about these four kids who met when uh, they were younger, they grow up, and then start talking about how one of them went missing and trying to figure out how that happened. And Killing Time, which is a murder mystery podcast kind of book where a girl decides to start her own murder mystery podcast and then finds herself in a real murder mystery in her hometown. So all of these, um, you're seeing the final art but there's a lot of sketches and brainstorming that happens beforehand. So on the right are all of the sketches that I had done for this book. Um, as you can see, the trim size, the size of the book changed at one point, um, but this is the, the, main, the main ideas of this kind of mirror world were, was what I was playing with. And these were the, the sketches that I pitched and we ended up with this cover. Same thing for who we were in the dark, um, a lot of, play on negative space and a silhouette of a person being missing or something being out of place. Um, they liked all of these sketches and ended up going with the one that was a little more subtle where it's the reflection of all the characters in this lake that they visit, but the one who went missing is kind of distorted within the ripples. Um, and let's end killing time. This was kind of showing, uh, trying to show some kind of menace while also implying in some of them that it's a podcast, it's an audio form that a lot of the story is being revealed in each one of these episodes. So it's the the audio levels kind of mixing in with audio levels on top. And then on the bottom are the trees and the houses along in this neighborhood. Um, a sketch that I really liked this that we ended up not going with that I kind of want to finish now is that top left one where it's the woman kind of peering out through the streets. It kind of has like a cool neighborhood watch feel. It feels very eerie and I, I want to finish that one up someday. Um, so I don't only work in publishing. Um, on the side, I do some other work as well. These are uh, some things on different markets. Plot Knot is a production company logo um, that we're currently working on uh, with this one author I work with. Uh, and then Sky Telescope Magazine. I do a lot of magazine illustrations as well. And then the one on the far right is for a game company like Magic the Gathering and, and things like that. So Plot Knot was because it's uh, less of a story and more of a tone where it's this is going to be a production company logo for um, a company that does a lot of imagination based like young imagination adventure type things. Um, it's not really a story, but I'm illustrating a, a tone and a feeling of, uh, of adventure. Um, so these were some of the options for that. We ended up going with this one of an astronaut kind of rowing on the water and a rocket ship taking off and in the smoke revealing like this big colorful universe. Um, and that's that much larger. So all these pieces will be moving. So it's very, very detailed and very large. Um, Sky and Telescope Magazine. This was a magazine that was dedicated to Henrietta Swan Leavitt, one of the um, 
the four most accomplished women computers at Harvard um, Observatory. Computers being she, before there were computers, she was making the computations and doing all of the math and and things like that uh, involved in, oh, I'm getting a phone call, involved in looking at stars and deciding uh, their luminosity, not necessarily uh, star is brighter because it's closer or it's darker because it's farther away, but understanding the luminosity de not dependent on distance. Um, she's the, the woman who figured that equation out. So this bar, uh, magazine was dedicated to her and it was uh, kind of making this, uh, this cover to show how important she is. And um, uh, this, the game card, this was called the Raven Man. Um, and it's supposed to be made out of stained glass and it's supposed to be this for this game, um, a kind of legendary card, like a real big bad guy. So, uh, and all the legendary cards are made out of stained glass and it's this Raven Man character who can see through the eyes of Ravens. Uh, Ravens. So uh, they wanted me to illustrate something that really felt uh, ominous and foreboding. So uh, those are the sketches on the right and then on the left is what they chose. So uh, I'm not only an illustrator, I'm a designer and art director, which means um, I design book covers, but I also hire artists to do their illustrations for books that we work on at Harper. So here are some of my book designs um, that I made myself. These weren't with outside artists. Um, Crier's War is an illustration that I kind of made to look like it was etched in metal. So it's part illustration and part Photoshop, but after um, post effects. Uh, if these wings could fly is is kind of a cut paper design, um, which is really fun. Uh, this will be funny someday. Um, I tried to actually make the title by bruising a banana with a um, toothpick to see if I could get that that effect, but it's very hard to do that and have it um, and to scan it and have it read. So that is actually a Photoshop job that uh, is supposed to look like it's bruised into the banana. Um, and then the initial insult is actually, uh, it's a book about someone being walled up behind a brick wall as they're being interrogated. It's a really intense story. So I thought it'd be cool to have the title be made out of like brick dust and the floor is covered in these chunks of bricks. Um, and I actually made that myself. <laughs> I laid out a, a big board in my uh, apartment and smashed some bricks and brushed the brick dust into the title type. Uh, which was really fun and really work intensive, but um, I think it was worth it. It came out really nice. So in my design day to day, um, it could be all Photoshop. It could be all done by hand. It's really, it's interesting because of that. Now, when I'm not doing the work myself, um, if a book calls for a certain style of art that um, I can't make on my own, we'll commission other artists. Um, now, these are three very different styles of art um, that I've commissioned for. Uh, Tercial and Eleanor is a, uh, a Garth Nix book, which Garth Nix, uh, some of your, the viewers of this much must, uh, must love him because he's, he's a big author for fantasy people. Um, and that was uh, Ashley McKenzie who did that artwork. It's a really fantastic artist. And the one in the middle um, is an artist called Red Nose Studios who actually builds these sets, makes these figures, sews their clothing, and then photographs it as his illustrations, which is incredible. I have to say, you have to go look up Red Nose Studio. Um, just an incredible creative person. Um, and then Muse on the right um, is a story. Uh, it's about kind of a world's fair in an alternate universe where the United States is a monarchy. Um, it takes place in that that time period of World's Fair with like Tesla and all these people are coming out with these inventions. And I wanted to make it look like a poster of a World's Fair. Um, so I, I hired this illustrator, uh, Florian Schomer, who did a lot of package design. And it turned out that if he did um, like package design with patterns and these really tight designs, that it translated really well to being this kind of poster for, for this World's Fair kind of style. Um, and it came out really great. These are some other ones. Redemption Prep on the right is actually 3D modeling. Um, so it's all done on the computer to make it look like it's real, this kind of glowing neon behind these, these vines, uh, which that was, um, oh, I'm having trouble forgetting his name. That's terrible. Richard, Richard Coleman, I think his name is. Um, and then in the center, uh, that's Michael Marzicano. I know that one. Uh, and he is a fantastic illustrator. It's a kind of, um, 
fantasy YA novel based in a world uh, that resembles uh, old timey India. So it's uh, about this woman who's kind of an assassin within this this culture uh, in this in this story, and it's really fantastic. Uh, Root Magic, done by Jen Bricking, is uh, is another story. It's a middle grade about this family who finds out they have these kind of magical powers, and they're learning from their their grandmother, and it's kind of a passed down tradition. Um, so you see, all of these are the finished product, um, and it takes some time to get here. It looks really nice and put together, but it's months and months of work sometimes to get them to this point. So I have a couple um, projects that I can show you the process from beginning to start, and these two are very different from how, uh, what kind of book they are, but also how they came to be. So A Light Too Bright um, is this book about um, a young troubled teen whose grandfather dies, and he had a really uh, great connection with his grandfather. Um, but he had Alzheimer's and one day he walked off um, and they couldn't find him and he was found dead. And this, uh, this young man is having a lot of trouble with his life. So he decides to follow the, the last steps of his grandfather's last couple of days. So he runs away and starts taking, he took a train that his grandfather took and is following these clues, trying to figure out what happened to him on his last couple of days. Um, it's a really beautiful and emotional story. Um, and we went with Vic Donai, who is an illustrator who has some really beautiful and emotional uh, artwork. So we went to her um, partially because she comes up with really fantastic ideas and concepts. We didn't know, really know what we wanted for the cover, um, but thought if we gave her the manuscript, she could come up with something really great. So these were the sketches she turned in. Um, this was at a time when it was called a Diary of Time Forgotten. While you're working on these things, the manuscript is being edited. Sometimes the title change changes. Um, so all of this is happening at once, so it's very free-flowing. Uh, but regardless of title changing, we thought these were incredible, um, and we really liked this sketch all the way on the left. We thought the grandfather in the clouds, it's it's kind of about memory um, and about uh, lost family members, and we thought that was really fantastic. And the adventure element of following his steps shown in the train and that beautiful landscape, thought with her colors would be incredible. And it was. Uh, so this is the final art that she turned in uh, with the new title. Really beautiful and really detailed. And because of that, I, as the designer, I have to take this artwork and go, okay, how do I make this into a package for a book? I have to put the title on it and I have to put the author's name on it. But this is so beautiful that I wanted to do as little as possible to interfere with it. And the author and the editor agreed. So the title is very, very small. And so is the author name so that the artwork can really step forward and grab people's attention. Um, so that was a pretty straightforward start to finish. Um, the Remarkables or uh, Remarkables is a different story. So this is actually a middle grade book that my supervisor was working on. Um, when I came in, um, I believe I just started this job. Uh, this is where they were with the sketches. So this book is about a young girl and her friend uh, while exploring in the woods, come across a group of teenagers they follow them and see like, oh, what are the older kids doing? And then realize that they're turning invisible and they don't know why or what's happening, but they think, wow, that's amazing. Um, and they follow them and try and figure out how this is happening. So these are the sketches from, uh, from an artist. Um, they ended up picking this sketch and going to final art. And this is at a time where at, at each one of these stages, you're showing sketches, you're showing final art. The manuscript is changing, the title might change. So there's a lot up in the air. Um, when we brought this in and we're showing this to our sales and marketing team and also the author, they looked at this and thought it was really beautiful, but it feels very young. It is a middle grade book, but it's also, when you read it, has a lot of um, mystery and it's it's a very dramatic story. And this feels a little too uh, Disney-ish, a little too um, playful, um, and it it doesn't hit the tone of the book. So even though we had gotten this far with it and the illustrator did an amazing job, we ended up killing this cover and starting over. So when I was working, uh, watching this happen, my boss was working on this and then she had some other work to do and said, okay, we're starting over, you take over. So now I'm starting from scratch with all of this information, I have to find another artist, another direction. And I found Dan Burgess, who's an incredible artist. Um, he's done work with us before it has that middle grade feel and that feel of adventure, but it's a lot more dramatic and uh, tonally matches the book better. So we went to Dan, uh, gave him the manuscript and said, what do you think? So he turned in these sketches. 
now they're beautiful and there's a lot of them and Dan is a pro so they are very tight and you you get immediately what he's going for um so I have to show these but before I show them I have to put them in context of a book package so I have to put the title on them and the author's name so in looking at these I did my best to work the type in with the sketch so that they're not it's one and the other they're both working together um and in looking at these some work better than others uh C in the top right showing the shadows of the kids and kind of little sparkles around where they might be is a beautiful illustration but for a cover you don't really get what the book is about so we have little things like that criteria that we judge a book by and this was the sketch we ended up liking uh it's really tight and beautiful but in looking at it there's kind of something missing and there's a couple of notes we have first of all um the main character is a girl and that silhouette looks a lot like a boy um looks like he's missing his right hand <laughs> a little bit um also there's something about it that feels uh it, it's missing a part of the story so it's this kid running through the woods and there's this beam of light but there's really nothing about this uh about these teenagers that they find that are turning invisible um about the house that they find that all the teenagers are in it, it can kind of be really about anything and we want to get a little more specific with this cover so the viewer knows what they're getting um so we said that to dan and he turned in these options which i think are great so it's that same forest silhouette with the space in the middle and now we have the girl kind of approaching looking in so it's it's giving the viewer an in onto the story and in one it's showing the house and the teens and one that silhouette of the trees in uh to make that space is in the shape of the teens and one you can kind of see a shimmer of the, the uh invisible teenagers around her and in the one all the way on the right the woods are in shape in the shape of the house so we showed these and everyone thought it was fantastic and we liked the one with the the woods in the shape of a house so that's from the sketch and then that's to the final so a little bit more uh work intensive a lot of back and forth a little more collaboration than the first one um but we both for both of them ended up with really beautiful covers so that's kind of how uh how my job or jobs work so that's all I have for you. And let me know if you have any questions. Yes, definitely. That's awesome. Just a couple from your presentation. But the last one, is there usually a uh, minimum amount of sketches that people should submit for like their initial sketch? When you're looking for an artist to um, hire for a book, do you have like a set number? Like do they have to submit three? There was a couple, there were like six specifically. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was like a thing or... <laughs> um well so usually the the number the minimum is is three okay. um some people have one idea that they're really into and and send it in and, and it depends on really the uh the caliber of artists too sometimes we've worked with I don't know if you know Kadir Nelson is an amazing uh fine art painter mm -hmm. um and when we get the chance to work with them we're like whatever you want to do because <laughs> this work is so beautiful <laughs> he usually turns in one sketch but that's really all you need because his ideas and his are, are amazing but uh mm -hmm. usually it's three and then uh if they have more ideas like dan is just somebody who's chock full of concepts so he's going to throw everything at you and he's going to mm -hmm. have a lot of ideas and a lot of them are going to be really good so if he sends in six there's going to be some good ones and the more sketches the better discussion we can have with the editors and the author of which direction we want to go in so the more sketches the better but sometimes sometimes all you all you need is one also with the artists, it's, I was going to ask you, what do you look for when you hire one? It sounds like art style and tone. Is there any other criteria for hiring an artist for a book cover? Um, yeah, I mean, art style and tone and um, are a big part of it. Uh, some artists are incredible, but they're just not going to work for the book you're looking at. Mm. Uh, so uh, that's a big part of it is, is hiring somebody who's really going to bring the best uh, part of this book forward. Um, also, if it's an own voices story, uh, so if the author is Black or Vietnamese or whatever, and they're talking about their story in their personal voice, we usually like to have an artist who has the same background so they mm. can speak to it on a similar uh, truthful level that the author is going for. Um, so that's really good. Uh, there's an imprint at uh, HarperCollins called Heart Drum that is um, a new imprint uh, run by Rosemary Bronson, who is uh, incredible. And it's all um, native uh, authors, and mm -hmm. all the covers are done by uh, native illustrators. So, um, 
it's it's a really special imprint because of that. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned that uh, one of the artists had the manuscript. So do you always get a manuscript when you're about to work on a book or do they just give you the synopsis or? <laughs> it really depends on how far the book is along. Sometimes they say, oh. this is when the book is going to be out. This is when it's going to be published. Um, and they don't have anything yet. And they're, everybody's working for the same deadline. So the author is working on the deadline, trying to get the book in. We're trying to get the cover done. So sometimes it's, this is what the book is about, start the cover. Um, other times we have a pretty fully fleshed out manuscript that they're just editing and doing some final tweaks on. And they'll send that to us, um, which is nice. And sometimes uh, sometimes the book is done, which is great. And we can just send it to the artist. Um, some people like to read it. Uh, I think fantasy novels are the best example of you should probably read most of the book before you do the cover because it's so much world building. Mm. Um, other times you just get hung up on stuff and really all you need is the synopsis just to boil it down to the essentials. Okay. You as the artist, um, is there a fav do you have a favorite medium to work with? Um, I actually tend to work in a, a wide variety of media, uh, specifically um, like making things out of different media and then bringing them into digital and kind of um, fusing them together. I like to do that because it, it gives the art a sense of, um, I, I don't know the word, but um, people look at it and they don't know how it's made, mm -hmm. which is really nice. Um, I like to have it kind of ambiguous in that way where people don't know how it's made so that they're actually looking at the, the image and not the quality of it. If you do a watercolor, you may end up just like looking at how it's painted and not really what's painted. So um, mm. I like to mix media in that way. And sometimes things work better for drawing trees or painting skies and, and all that. And it also helps me um, stay really interested. If, the, if it's constantly changing and I go, you know what, I'm going to make all the trees out of charcoal this time. Um, it, makes, it makes things new and fresh every time. That's awesome. How important is it to ensure that your portfolio is diverse? Uh, make sure your portfolio is diverse. Um, it's pretty important um, when I'm pitching artists, as you can see, maybe I'll go back to, to one of the, yeah, so looking at um, Dan's portfolio, he's got a lot of different things in there. He's got uh, figures that are all different ages, so that mm. if we're saying, oh, we're going to work on a teen book, we know that he can draw teenagers, he can draw middle grade aged kids, he's got a wolf on there, he does animals really well. Um, maybe this portfolio right here is not super diverse, but um, go to, to Victo's. Yeah, Victo's is, is all over the place too, different perspectives, different color palettes, all of this stuff. Um, it's great because when you pitch an artist showing these pieces, the editor might go, oh, these are great, but I don't know how I feel about them for this book until they see, say, this center image mm -hmm. uh, with the girl with the backpack and the cat on her shoulder. That piece alone clinched Victo for this cover because they said that is the amount of drama and adventure that we want for this cover. So if that piece wasn't on there, we might not have worked with her. So having this variety of different tones and different subject matter, um, one of the pieces is going to grab someone when they're you're being pitched. So, uh, so yeah, drawing a lot of different things, I think it's very helpful. Do you have a specific genre that you prefer to work on? Um, I know you mentioned fantasy is like a really good one to read the book for world building. Do you have fantasy one of your favorites or? <laughs> I do really like fantasy because you can be the most creative in that because mm. the, the subject matter is all super uh fantastical and imaginative and they want you to ref to reflect that in your artwork so that's really fun um but i also really like just like classic mystery there's something about that that uh i mean that's a genre that is my favorite to read so mm -hmm. i like working on that kind of stuff because then i'm a part of the process of this all coming together i'm making the artwork that sits along with this thing i love to read so um yeah fantasy mystery um, and horror sometimes too. I like this subtlety of horror. I don't want to draw like a crazy monster with all these teeth, but I like the <laughs> subtlety of like maybe an ominous shadow or uh, ominous or creepy lighting. Things like that are really fun too. Have you ever gotten inspiration for a project based on a book that you had read that had nothing to do with the project? Um, hmm. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. From a book? Mm-hmm. 
book. Um, maybe it's just the the vibe and the tone. I really like Tana French's novels. Mm. Um, and I don't really work. I mean, that's a adult uh, trade. So it's not for teens or middle grade. Um, but there is something about that tone she writes about just like kind of creepiness amongst beautiful scenery in like Ireland. And then you like, I have an image of my mind of like blowing grass and like that kind of ripple in grass and just like thinking about like, okay, well, that's a creepy tone I could bring to maybe a horror book or, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's all I can think about for that, really. Have any authors that you would want to illustrate for that you haven't already? Yes. Um, <laughs> I would love to do Stephen King. If anybody oh. knows Stephen King, um, uh, I, he's one of my favorite authors. Um, and Agatha Christie, I mean, mm. being a mystery lover, um, there's something about Agatha Christie that I would love to to work on those kind of books. Um, yeah, yeah, those two are the ones that stick out a lot. Sorry, I made fun. No, it's okay. <laughs> Go for it. Oh. <laughs> you can keep going. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so what is your uh, creative process like? How do you go about starting working on a project? Do you have like a, a specific day and time that you have to, to work on like that? Are you a morning person, a night owl? I'm a night owl for sure. Okay. Um, and also because I work during the day uh, mm. for HarperCollins, I sign on nine to five and then five to midnight is my illustration time and then weekends. So I'm usually um, at this desk at night drawing in a sketchbook or um, I draw on my iPad sometimes if I'm uh, crunch for time. Um, but yeah, usually we'll read the manuscript. Uh, I have a text-to-speech app that sometimes if I'm really under a time crunch, I can turn the manuscript into an audiobook where it will read it to me while I draw. Oh, cool. It's very helpful. <laughs> kind of a robot -y voice, but sometimes you need to get through a book really quick so you can turn up the speed. And then I uh, sit and draw. And while I'm listening or reading, um, making lists of important things, important emotions, uh, objects, character names, all that kind of stuff. And uh, it really at a certain point becomes like a math equation of like, well, what things when I add them together really represent this story. Mm -hmm. This is something that we've, we've had authors come before. Uh, so we always ask if they ever listen to music when they're writing, do you listen to music or have any other things that you have to do to get in the, mm -hmm. like, to get focused for your work? Well, when, uh, so when starting, I'm listening probably to the manuscript. Um, if I'm reading, I can't have any any sounds, maybe like a rain sound effect that's usually cozy. Uh, yeah. When I'm concepting maybe music, um, I need to be thinking uh, like pretty deeply about things. So maybe just music in the background. But when I'm doing the actual artwork and making things, I'm usually listening to audiobooks or podcasts because at that point, it's it's not so much the idea. It's the time of, okay, now I just sit down and make the thing. Um, and I get, we'll get sick of music really quickly because it's a long time sometimes. <laughs> so, <laughs> nice narrative or a, or a comedy thing or, or the way I usually go. Okay. Do you have any book cover artists that are inspirations to you or anyone you would want to like collaborate with or have you collaborated with any other, is that a thing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I usually, I don't collaborate with de designers too often, but mm. I mean, uh, I have designers that I really admire. Um, Oliver Monday is incredible. Um, um, oh, now I'm blanking on a lot of them. Um, <laughs> Jim Tierney, uh, we actually went to the same university. Jim Tierney is an incredible uh, designer. Um, and his wife, Sarah Wood, uh, is also mm. an incredible designer. And they're both designers and illustrators which um, I feel a certain kinship <laughs> with those types of people. Um, yeah, and, and then as far as just like, as artists, there are, there are so many. I, uh, I can't even, I, I can't think of one because <laughs> there are so many. Um, I mean, Kadir Nelson, I've gotten to work with twice now. And Kadir is really, that is like a lifelong, like I can't believe I got the chance to work with Kadir. So that's pretty amazing. I'm, yeah, I'm lucky to say that, like, anybody that I've really, really wanted to work with, um, I've gotten the chance to. HarperCollins is pretty open-minded to 
whatever your creative ideas are, they'll give you a chance. So mm. I've been really lucky in that way. I, I might have missed, how did you end up working for HarperCollins? And then also with authors, sometimes they need a literary agent um, to be able to get into a publishing house. Is it the same for artists? Is there any like kind of um, barrier between getting your artwork up or not? Luckily these days, there's really no barrier. Um, okay. Being an artist and having the internet means that pretty much everybody's getting the same amount of time. If you're putting if you're putting your work out there and putting it on different sites, with Pinterest and Tumblr and all, all of these <laughs> things, making your own website, um, just like getting it out on all these platforms, you'll be seen as much as anybody that has an illustration agent. Um, I have an illustration agent and a lot of people do. Um, the difference between having one and not having one is really um, how much uh, do you want to be running your artwork and um, an illustration like a business, like a small business? Um, and how much do you, or do you want to just be making the artwork? I don't want to be doing any paperwork. I don't want to keep up my website. I don't want to do any of that stuff. I just want to be making the artwork. Some people really like running it like a small business. I mm. personally do also. Um, but an illustration agent will take care of all that stuff. They'll do the paperwork for you. They'll promote your work and all that. Um, and they'll fight for budget, make sure that you're being treated well. Mm. Um, but they take a cut. So it's everybody, everything is balanced out in that way. But if you have an agent or don't have an agent, I don't think that means anything for people seeing your artwork. It's just really a preference of, do you want to sign contracts and <laughs> and keep up a website and maybe learn code, make prints and mail them out and stuff? Yeah. Okay. Um, but as far as getting into publishing, I went to school for illustration and being a senior or maybe I was a junior as an illustrator and um, it was like really close to the recession at that time. It's really hard to make money as an illustrator, especially when you're new and nobody knows you. Um, being an illustrator is, is really hard work and it's a lot of years before it ever pays off. Mm -hmm. um, so I decided to teach myself design and start learning design because there's a lot of in-house jobs for designers. There's not a lot for illustrators. Those are kind of gig, gig jobs. But if I can get an in-house design job, no matter what it is, I can get a paycheck, some health insurance, and then maybe get my own apartment and move to New York City and, and all these things that are really expensive and hard to do on a gig-based job. Um, so I ended up working at Macmillan. I got a junior design job at Macmillan. Um, I was not doing a lot of covers. I was doing a lot of mechanicals and a lot of like assistant type work, but I had a paycheck and then um, was doing that and slowly started really liking it. And then I got more covers and this thing that was kind of a means to an end slowly became a means onto itself. And I really uh, fell in love with book cover design. I never thought, I thought eventually I would quit. And once my illustration was doing well enough, I'd quit and just go do an illustration. But now uh, I like both and I'm just going to do both. And that, yeah. And eventually McMillan, I moved on from McMillan to HarperCollins. So. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you obviously do adult and um, teen covers. What, what uh, would you say draws you to... Um, doing YA, what's the difference for you when you're designing a book for a YA as opposed to an adult? Well, it's got, the reason is kind of like why I went from Macmillan to, because I was in adult trade at Macmillan, mm -hmm. I went over to children's, which is YA middle grade at HarperCollins, is because it's a lot more embracing of illustration. Mm -hmm. um, and adult um, is great, but there's something about children's books that is like the epitome of creativity. It's like the ultimate source of creativity is writing and for kids because kids have great imaginations and you're making up worlds you're you're creating all of this stuff in an adult trade you can like um you could be working on biographies and it's just a photo of a person and you got to pick the type you pick the photo blah 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 but in children's books it's like it's a whole world what does that look like and that's your job to figure it out yeah um, that's that's really fun and as far as being a creative person i don't think there's anything better than that what is the most exciting or maybe I shouldn't ask it that way <laughs> but like a book cover that you got um to be the not the most creative on but you had maybe more collaboration on with like the author or the editor talking about it 
that ended up turning really well that you love? Huh. Um, the Criers War books, uh, mm -hmm. Criers War and Ironheart, I really loved. Um, that was a book I was really struggling with and was working with other artists and we weren't just, we we're just not getting it, um, not getting there. And I talked to my supervisor and said, I have an idea. Um, I'm just going to work on it this weekend and bring it in. And can we uh, move forward with it potentially? And she's like, yeah, go for it. Do whatever you want. And so I tried out this thing and I put, it's the, uh, I think it's earlier on in this presentation. Yeah, there it is, Cryer's War. Because it's like a mixture of medieval fantasy and also AI robot kind of story. Mm. In this, It's like a medieval setting, but the AI are like the kings and their rulers and the humans are like the underlings. And um, I really love that mashing of worlds. So I wanted to do a fantasy cover carved out of metal and it just... Uh, because we weren't getting there and I was just like, I'm just going to try something. I went full creative on it and just went like, well, it's going to get picked or it's not going to get picked. So I'm going to make something I really like. And it worked. And um, the author was really excited about it and said like, well, we're doing this for the next book and just let me have total creative freedom on the next book wow. to do something similar. Um, and they came out so beautifully. And because um, people liked them so much, they, and, and the books were, um, we're getting a lot of buzz because they are really well written. Mm. Uh, I could do fun specs on it and we actually printed on metallic paper and then debossed it so you can feel the bumps in the metal and it shines like metal. Yeah. That's so that's so cool. So now this book is like it's um it's like a piece of artwork. So that was a really fun one. Awesome. That is awesome. How do you overcome any creative blocks? Ooh, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> if I had an answer for that. I would never have a creative block again. Um, I'm a big <laughs> runner. So sometimes like literally running from my problems will help solve them. Just like mm. getting, stop, <laughs> stop trying to fix it and just go do something else. And running until I'm exhausted will usually help me overcome it. But um, yeah, no, there's no, there's no one answer for that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I just think of like all those movies about authors going out for a run. <laughs> Yeah. Like early in the morning. <laughs> um, it helps you if you're angry or frustrated, just like just sprint in one direction <laughs> until you figure it out. And if you're exhausted, it's it's really hard to overthink things. Mm, right. Overthinking uh, is probably a common issue. Mm -hmm. right. Do you have any creative goals for the future? Um I would like to uh to do my own kind of world building. My, my job right now um, in both Harper and illustration is um, I realize other people's ideas. I bring a visual reference to someone else's writing, to, to someone else's idea. Um, and I have some ideas for writing on my own that I'm working on and, um, and also some ideas of just world building visually. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of doing my own thing in that way. Uh, I think it's it's the dream of everybody with a creative background to do something like Tim Burton, like to to make a world, to make a visual language and to fully populate it with your ideas, mm. um, I think would be amazing. Um, I don't think I'm going to be making a movie anytime soon, but- um, oh, you Burton never know. Sketchbooks. <laughs> I have sketchbooks. Tim Burton did a lot of writing. I'm mm. starting to do a lot of writing. So, so we'll see. That's great. But in the meantime, I have a pretty fun job, so I'm not I'm not upset about it. So that was um, my last question. Well, actually, no, one more. Um, mm -hmm. If you had any tips for teens wanting to become illustrators or get into design, what would you what would you say to them? Um, if you want to be an illustrator, um, draw all the time. Get a sketchbook. Draw things that you like to draw. Um, and just do it all the time, make it a regular activity. If you want to be an illustrator, you're probably already doing that all the time anyway, drawing on the back of menus and in your notebooks and in your textbooks, maybe. That's what I did um, to, to the chagrin of many of my teachers. Um, and uh, go out and see art, go to galleries, go see shows. Um, if you want to be a designer, specifically a book designer, go to Barnes & Noble, just flip through books. All the designers' names are on the flaps you find a book you really like write down that name look them up see what they do um and also because illustration and design is one of those jobs that um everybody wants to do but it's 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 
really it's really fun. It's also really isolating because you're doing it alone all the time. So a lot of people are open, like me, to people emailing me and saying, how did you do it? Or can you look at my art? Tell me what you think. Um, I love to do that. And a lot of people do. Um, if you find a designer or an artist you really like, reach out to them. See uh, if they'll answer your questions, if they'll look at your art, if they'll talk to you, give you any advice. A lot of people will. So um, yeah, just fully immerse yourself in the thing you want to do and just keep doing it. It'll happen. Sure. Thank you so much, David. Um, it's a wonderful presentation and thank you for answering my questions. Um, do you want to let everyone know where they can find you online? I know your website address, but I figure I'd like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm not on Twitter or anything like that, but I, I'm on Instagram and I have a website. So uh, I believe it's D Curtis Studio on Instagram, uh, but my website is uh, david-curtis.com, and and that's my most up to date things with it, which has my contact info and and my social media. So that's beautiful. So <laughs> thank you um, for joining us today. Thanks for and having us. No problem. Support public libraries. Like, share, and subscribe for more great videos.